Good morning, everyone. I was telling the musicians that I can't start early because I got yelled at the last time I did that. Our tech team doesn't like it when I don't wait for the whole countdown, and, and, and Josh is a pretty imposing figure, so I don't want to make him mad or anything. But good morning. It's good to have you in the house of the Lord this morning. Everybody doing all right? Everybody ready to welcome winter? A, a few of you, a few of you, a couple of you rebuke that, but uh, that's okay, because uh, your pastor is praying for it. So, uh, no, we're just so glad to have you in the house of the Lord today. We want to uh, thank you for being with us. We want to thank our online congregation for coming and, and watching and being a part of our service today. We've got some announcements uh, we need to start with, and uh, but first I want to start by reading. We've got a, a lovely little note here by uh, Brother Charles and Sister Evelyn that they'd like me to read to the church. Thank you, Pastor Chris and Crystal and the Oak Grove Church for all that you did for us on Pastor Appreciation Sunday. Your cards, kind words, gift cards, and money are greatly appreciated. Of course, we enjoyed the food and fellowship after service. There are no words to describe how much we appreciate what you all mean to us. If we can ever be of service to you, please do not hesitate to contact us as we serve the Lord together. Reverend Charles and Evelyn Reedling. And uh, I had the opportunity to uh, say my piece about it last week, about how much we greatly appreciated all the love that was poured out uh, to us. And uh, I know uh, Brother Charles and Sister Evelyn feel the same way. We have a wonderful church, and we're so blessed to have the honor and the privilege of being able to pastor Oak Grove. So thank you all very much. Um, a couple of announcements we need to make. First of all, I was told uh, uh, Ryan and Rochelle are not here today, and they asked me, would you please do a, quote, saucy, unquote, uh, announcement of the carnival on Saturday? I said, I'm not sure what you mean by saucy, uh, so I'm going to just do the best that I can. We have a carnival on Saturday, and... Um, we want y'all to come. You can dress up. No, it's an exciting time, and, and I do want to mention something. There are no carnival rides, okay? Don't come expecting like a Ferris wheel and the tilt-a-whirl and the make-me-puke and all that kind of thing, all right? Uh, what we're talking about is that there's going to be carnival games that are going to be played in the gym. We're going to have food. We're gonna, uh, we are going to have candy, but you are welcome. If, you're, if you haven't had a chance to donate candy, if you came in and you saw that box and said, oh, I forgot the candy, well, good thing is, we don't have to do anything except open the bag, so you can still bring it with you, and uh, we'll take care of that. But uh, we're going to be giving out candy and all that. And then actually at the end of the night, we're going to have a fireworks display. So come on out and, uh, and be a part of that. It's going to be a great time. You are welcome to dress up. We just ask you, obviously, not to dress in anything satanic if you wouldn't mind kind of a church thing you know what I mean uh, but you're welcome to dress up in in funny cutesy little things and and, and all of that but we're going to have a wonderful time on Saturday come on out it's going to be from 5 to 7 30 please this is not just a church thing please tell people about this please let people know that they're welcome we've been putting it on Facebook in fact if you have a Facebook account and uh, you are friends with our page which you should be because it's your church Please feel free to share that on your page so that more and more people will know that we're having that. But it's going to be a great time. There's going to be music. There's going to be food. We're going to be feeding you and everything. So uh, come out on Saturday uh, from 5 o'clock to 7.30. I also wanted to mention those of you who have told Ryan and Rochelle, yes, you will work a game. They have not forgotten, and they hope that you haven't either. So please make sure you come out and be ready to work whatever game it is that you agreed to. So uh, it's going to be a great time. I also want to mention that next week, we have uh, next Sunday, we have our church business meeting. That's going to be at 4 o'clock. And I'm doing that because I know there are other churches that are having trunk or treats and that sort of thing. We want to make sure that you have plenty of time to get out and still participate in that and support uh, those churches and uh, their their little fall festivals or whatever it is that they're doing. I uh, also want to mention to you that we are having on the first Sunday in November, it will be our Veterans Day uh, recognition service. And so all of you veterans, 
we, if you're able, now I understand some of you are not able to fit into the uniform that you wore when you were in the military. Or some of you don't have that uniform anymore because your wife turned it into a quilt or a dish rag or something. I get that. But if you happen to have your uniform and you're able to still fit into it or at least close fit into it, um, you know, if you're bursting a couple of buttons, it's okay. You know, we'll just poke fun at you later. But if you're able to do that, it'd be great if you could um, dress in that. But we do want to make sure that all of our veterans are here uh, on that Sunday, we want to recognize you and give you the honor that you deserve. Uh, we're going to have the slideshow as we usually do and all of that. And then there will be a luncheon afterwards. Uh, now, Sister Tanya had posted on our family page about uh, some of the menu. And many of you have already signed up for that. If you're wanting to know what you can make and how you can uh, uh, help and be a part of that luncheon, please see her. Now, she's actually not here today, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. Uh, but uh, you can always text her or contact her and she'll be more than happy to tell you or you can just look at the family page and you can see what needs to be done. Because of Veterans Day being the first uh, Sunday in November, we're actually going to move Mission Sunday to the second Sunday of November. So just keep that in mind that our Mission Sunday for November will not be the first Sunday. It'll be instead on Sunday, November 13th. And the last thing I just wanted to mention very quickly, November 17th, and I mean we're we're getting close to Thanksgiving and Christmas. It's coming fast, right? Uh, but November 17th, we're actually going to be having, instead of having a, a women's ministries Thanksgiving dinner, or men's fellowship, and all that kind of thing, we're combining all of our departments together. We're just going to have a church fellowship on November 17th at 6 p.m., and uh, it's going to be a great time. And we're going to talk to you about the menu and all that later, but we do want to let sur make sure that you know about it so you can put it on your calendars, all right? So November 17th, make sure and put that on your calendar. We want you to come out and be a part of that Thanksgiving dinner that we're going to have as a church, okay? All right, and I believe that's all the announcements that we have. Um, I do want to uh, say how good it is to have uh, Sister Lorraine Driggers and Sister Rita Thompson back with us in service and just continue to remember them in your prayers and remember their families in your prayers as well. Uh, I do have a couple of other prayer requests. Sister Mary Lambert had surgery last Wednesday. They had removed a cyst from her uh, spine, actually. And she was doing better, but from what I understand, she's having some issues this morning. And so Wendy had texted me and asked me to be praying for her. And then also, as I mentioned, Sister Tanya has been dealing with some sickness for the past couple of weeks that she's just not able to get over. And I don't know if you've ever had one of those where it seems like it's not... It's not a super serious sickness, but it's enough to make you miserable, and it just doesn't seem to want to go away, and the doctors are all scratching their heads kind of thing, and uh, she's been dealing with that, so please, please keep Sister Tanya in your prayers as well. But we know that God's a healing God, right? We know that God hears our prayers, amen? We know that we don't just say these prayers and they just kind of go out into the atmosphere and, and dissipate. We know that we have a God who hears when his children speak. We know that God, we have a God who hears that when we call on his name, he hears our, our cries, he hears our prayers, and he's going to answer those prayers. Amen? Amen. A few of you are in agreement with me. The rest of you get on board and we'll be all right. Would you stand with me this morning? <clears throat> and if you have a need, I just want you to signify that by lifting of your hand and just know that God knows exactly what it is that you're needing to bring to him. God knows exactly what you're going through. That's the thing is that our God is not oblivious to what we're dealing with. Our God is not oblivious to our problems. Our God knows what we're dealing with. He knows the problems that we're facing and he's got a plan to touch those needs and to meet those needs. Amen. Amen. Would you all just stretch your hands this way and let's have a word of prayer as we get started today. Father, I thank you for your healing power. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that we can come to you with every need that we have, that nothing is impossible for you. Lord, we know that you see exactly where we are and what we need, Father. And Lord, for my sister right now, I pray that you'll bring healing to her body. I pray you'll bring comfort to her right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, you see what the situation is, Lord, but we know that you are greater than all sickness. You're greater than all disease. You're greater than any problem or any trial that we can face, God. Lord, I pray that you will just touch her body right now 
in Jesus' name that you'll bring peace and comfort to it, Lord. God, that you will just uh, just calm this that is going on with her, Lord, and just give her uh, a peace so that she can worship, so that she can be with us, so that she can hear the word, so she can bless the holy name of Jesus Christ. Father, she has come up here asking for prayer because she knows where her help comes from. And we praise you and thank you for that, God. I pray that you'll honor that now in the name of Jesus. Let your Holy Spirit just descend upon her and touch her body now in Jesus' name. And we thank you for the healing and we thank you for all that you're doing in her and all you're going to do for her, Father. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's pray for these other needs today as well, church. Father, we thank you for all that are in this congregation, all that are watching online. Lord, we know that there are needs of, of, uh, that we could just go on and on and on. But God, we know that you are a God who hears our cries and that meets our needs. You already have the plan for our, our hope and our peace and for the answer to come before we've even asked it, God. But Lord, you want us to be obedient and you want us to be dependent dependent upon you. So as we come into this time of prayer, Lord, we are dependent upon you that you're going to meet these needs, that you're going to bring healing, that you're going to bring strength, that you're going to bring uh, the, the financial need is going to be met, Lord, that you're going to uh, calm our hearts and our minds, whatever it may be, God. Lord, we know that you're going to minister in a mighty and wonderful way. And we just pray, Father, that as we go through this service today, that you will be honored in all that we do. Lord, that you will be honored as we lift up your name in praise that you will be honored as we go to the time of of worship and as we go to the time of the word that as we worship in our giving god that everything that we do today god is going to bring you honor because that's why we have come into this place we have come into this place to worship you and to magnify the name that is above every other name the name of jesus christ our savior and our lord have your way in this service Lord, let us put all of our, our problems and, and, and trials aside and let our focus be upon you, God, and we will be careful to give you praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Glory to God. Remain standing if you would. And let's sing together today. Oh, would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, oh, there's power in the blood. Would you, or evil, a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Oh, there is power, power, oh, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, oh, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Sing that chorus again. There is power, power, oh, wonder-working power in the blood oh, of the Lamb. There is power, power, oh, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Oh, would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood. Oh, there's power in the blood. Oh, come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. Oh, there is power, power, oh, wonder-working power in the blood. Oh, of the Lamb, there is power, power, oh, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Oh, would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, oh, there's power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. Oh, there is power, power, oh, wonder-working power in the blood. Oh, of the Lamb, oh, there is power, power, 
power, oh wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Oh, would you do service for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood, oh there's power in the blood. Oh, would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. Oh, there is power, power, oh, wonder-working power in the blood. Oh, of the Lamb, oh, there is power, power, oh, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Come on, church, sing it out. There is power, power, oh, wonder-working power in the blood, oh, of the Lamb. There is power, power, oh, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Sing that first verse again. Oh, would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, oh, there's power in the blood. Oh, would you, or evil, a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Oh, there is power, power, oh, wonder-working power in the blood. Oh, of the Lamb, oh, there is power. Power, oh, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Oh, there is power, power, oh, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, oh, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Come on, sing it again, church. There is power, power, oh, wonder-working power in the blood oh, of the Lamb. There is power, power, oh, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Well, come on and give him a praise in this house this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for the power of the blood. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Um, I do want to mention, uh, because I had neglected to mention this last time, and I got in trouble. So, in case you didn't notice, I get in trouble a lot. Uh, but my wife and my boys are not here today in case you didn't notice that, and I've missed them very much. Uh, they usually go um, to Georgia. Our hometown has a pink out game in honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and with my sister-in-law being a breast cancer survivor, uh, she um, gets to go out on the field usually and all that, takes a couple snaps, throws the ball a little bit. No, I'm kidding. She doesn't get to do that, but you know they, they recognize all the breast cancer survivors, and so Crystal and the boys have made it sort of a tradition to go out there with them and, um, and be there with them for the game. And Jackson and Alan got to meet a player for the University of Georgia Bulldogs who is from our hometown. And so they're delighted and just thrilled and think that they are just hot snot. Um, I got to stay home and watch the dog. So there's that. But, uh, but I'm very glad because they're on the way home, and I've missed them very much, and they're supposedly watching right now. Dear, I have missed you very much. Boys, I've missed you, but not as much as I've missed your mama, and so please come home and be safe and all that stuff. All right, hopefully I have done what I need to do to make sure I don't get in trouble. We'll find out when she gets home. Anyway, uh, I want to ask our ushers to come at this time, and we're going to receive uh, this morning's tithe and offering. And I appreciate you supporting this church, and I appreciate you supporting the ministry. I know that, I tell you, money is one of those things that no, no pastor wants to talk about, it seems. No pastor wants to talk about giving and tithe and offering because they're afraid they're going to offend somebody. 
because maybe that person isn't giving the way that they should and and you know, whenever you talk about people's money, boy, I tell you, that's, that's when the claws can come out. You know what I mean? You can lose some friends real fast when you begin to talk about that. But I've always looked at giving as worship. I've always looked at giving as a time where we are telling God how grateful we are for everything that he has given us. And I know we are a blessed people. Even those of us who maybe if you're in this house and you say, well, I struggle financially and all that, but you've got food on your table and you've got clothes on your back and you've got people that support you and love you. And I mean, we're, we are a blessed people. Amen. And this is not about bill paying time. This is not about, well, I need to give so that, you know, the preacher don't get on to me. This isn't about guilt even. It's, you know, I better put some money in before uh, the preacher gets mad. This is about us worshiping God. And saying, God, everything that we have, Lord, it belongs right back to you. And anything that you demand of me, anything that you require of me, God, I'm just going to put it right back to where you want it to be, Lord. Because everything I have, it's only because of you. Amen? And so I want you to really worship as you give today. Whatever it is that you give, however it is that, that the Lord has laid it on your heart with your tithe and your offering. I want you to give in a worshipful spirit today. And as you're putting the offering in, as a matter of fact, I just want you to say thank you, Lord, for what you provided. Just say that, just a little quick thank you to God. And I know he's going to bless it many times over. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all you have provided. Lord, you, you have provided so far above anything that we could possibly ask. God, you have always been there for us. And your word says that you've, you know, we've never seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. And, Lord, that is just as true today. I pray that you will bless all the offering and all the tithe that are brought in today, Lord, that it will go to bring souls into the kingdom of God, that it will go to fulfill the great commission that you have put upon our hearts and you have commanded of us, Lord, so that we can be faithful and true in all you have given us. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. God bless you as you give today. Thank you for your giving. I know the Lord is going to bless you many times over for your obedience. Amen. Yes, I saw many of you fanning. So I've adjusted that, and it should be perfect right about the time I'm dismissing. If we have any children that are going to children's church today, yes, yes, if you would just come real quickly. We want to make sure that we have a chat first, and you're not even in trouble. What do you think about that? I don't know, maybe you are in trouble, but not with me at least. So, how's it going, dude? How's it going, dude? Is that for me? Thank you. So oh, never mind. Boy, he didn't even, he didn't even acknowledge. He was just like, I'm going to put this over here so you can't reach it. So, hello, lovely children. How are we all today? What you eating? You got goldfish? Okay. Goldfish are good, ain't they? All right. Do your mommies and daddies ever tell you you're special? No. <laughs> You're dismissed. Um, <laughs> Megan just got called out. <laughs> Jacob's like, no, she does not. Thank you. Um, I'm going to think that's wrong and that they probably do. 
Uh, if nothing else, they tell us you're special. How about that? So, But do you know that as special as you are to your mom and dad and to your grandma and grandpa or to your aunts and uncles or whoever it may be or to your pastor, that you are even more special to God? God knows you better than anybody in this world could ever possibly know you. Do you know all the pretty hairs you got on your head, Maddie? You know God knows how many you've got? Exactly how many you've got. You know God knows how many goldfish you've eaten today? He does. He knows, he knows everything about you. He knows how many teeth you got. He knows how many little hairs in your eyebrows and all that. He knows all that about you because you mean that much to him. He created you. And the Bible even says that he knows the hairs on our head. And some of us, it's a little easier for him to count. But, um, but you guys, no matter what anybody else tries to say, if the, if the whole world turns against you and says, you're nothing, you're nobody, God has made you very special, and he loves you very much. And I don't ever, ever, ever want you to forget that, okay? Okay, we good? Can I have a goldfish? I'm just kidding. I don't want one. I'm just playing. River looked at me like, no. But anyway. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and then you guys can go to Children's Church, all right? Father, we thank you for these special children, Lord, and we know that each one of us are special in your eyes. God, we know that you know everything there is to know about us. You know things about us that we don't even know ourselves. And we thank you, Lord, because we know that you know these things because of your caring for us, because of the way that you love us. And we thank you and praise you for these kids. I pray, Lord, that they will be able to learn something about the Word in Children's Church today. God, that will stick with them, that they will be able to hide that word in their hearts, that they might not sin against you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all. Thank you so much. You left crumbs. I think you're special, Jacob. Thank you for getting your sister's trash. I appreciate that. Megan, be nicer to that boy, would you? I'd appreciate it. So. Stand with me again, if you would. Let's uh, have a time of worship just real quickly before we go into the Word today. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Potent Father of mercy and grace, Thou art welcome in this place. Lift your hands and sing it today. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Holy Thou art welcome in this place, omnipotent Father of mercy and grace. Thou art welcome in this place. Just welcome him today. Oh, Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Omnipotent Father of mercy. time to the Lord. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place.
you are welcome in this place this morning. God, as we go into this next part of the service, I pray that your anointing will just rest upon the listener, rest upon myself as I bring the word. God, that we will hear what you have to say to us and that we will respond to your word today. Lord, I pray, help us to put everything else aside and to instead focus upon your word this morning as it speaks to our hearts and as it encourages us and as it changes us, God. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Remain standing. Thank you, musicians. I appreciate your ministry today. But just remain standing for the reading of the word, if you would, in Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 28. Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 28. We're going to read that today. I pray the Lord blesses you with the word that he has laid on my heart this morning. The word of God says in Genesis chapter 32, starting in verse 22, and he, talking about Jacob, and he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his 11 sons and passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. So he sent them over the brook. And Jacob was left alone. That's important for you to remember. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with man, and hast prevailed. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word today. You may be seated this morning. I want to speak to you for a little while today about Jabbok. And I, some pronounce it Jabbok, some say Jabbok. The Hebrew is actually Yabok, but I have said Jabbok for a long time, and I'm not going to remember to say Yabok. So we're just going to go with Jabbok today, if that's all right. This is a passage of scripture that most of you are familiar with. If you've been in church for any amount of time, if you've been in Sunday school in children's church, you've heard about how Jacob wrestled and uh, with the angel of the Lord and, and all this kind of thing. You, you've heard that. But the part that I'm wanting to really focus upon, and we're, we're going to get to the, the rest of it as well, but the part that we want to start with today is where he went and what he did. You see, Jabbok was a tributary of the Jordan River. So it was, it was part of the river. And in the Bible, anytime we see a crossing of a river, it is representative of transition. It's representative of going from one part of your life into the next part of your life. As a matter of fact, you can take a look and see when uh, anytime there's any kind of a crossing whatsoever with the children of Israel, when they left Egypt and they came to the Red Sea and they crossed uh, through the sea as the Lord parted the waters and dried the ground and they were able to cross over. It represented them coming out of the world and then becoming into the place of God that where God was calling them to go. It was a transition because never more would they be bothered and would they be pursued by the Egyptian soldiers because God closed up the sea and swallowed those soldiers in the sea. We can take a look at it. When Elisha had seen Elijah go up in the whirlwind and, and Elijah had said that if you wait, if you see, uh, see me go, that you will receive the double portion that you've asked for. And so the cloak came down, the mantle came down, as I mentioned uh, last week, uh, the mantle came down and he took it and, and he smote the Jordan and he crossed over. He was transitioning into his ministry uh, before he was just the associate pastor or the youth pastor, you might say. He was just the assistant to the main man but now he was going from being the assistant being the second man into being the one that God was going to speak through the one that God was going to work through he was making that transition this is also a time of transition for Jacob you see, if you know anything about Jacob's life, you know that Jacob, from the moment that he was born, was nothing but a thief. 
and a con man. He was a swindler. In fact, when he was born, uh, of course, you know, he had a twin brother named Esau. And when he was born, Esau came out first, but then came Jacob. And Jacob was literally grabbing onto the heel, even as a baby in the womb, was grabbing onto the heel of Esau and, and came out that way. In fact, you know, if you take a look at that and you think about it for a moment, he wasn't even wanting to put out his own effort. He was relying on somebody else to give him what he wanted and give him what he needed. And so the name Jacob, and you may have heard me talk about this before, it literally means one who grasps the heel, which is, uh, it, it's considered a derogatory thing, actually, in Hebrew culture. You're considered a con man. You're considered a liar. You're considered a thief. Well, Jacob, sure enough, lived up to that in his life because as uh, as you know uh, with the story of Jacob and Esau when uh, Esau had been out hunting and here Jacob was and he had the the bowl of lentils and and uh, he was making himself a lunch and Jay and Esau had been out hunting it wasn't just like he went out that morning and came back that afternoon he had been out for days hunting and had nothing to eat he was starving he he felt like that he was at the point of death and Jacob being the good brother instead of saying well here brother have some of this, get some sustenance, he decided, I'm going to make the most of this opportunity, and I'm going to swindle my brother out of his birthright. He's in a desperate place right now, and so I'm going to swindle him out of his birthright, and that's exactly what Jacob did. We also know that later on, that when Isaac was getting ready to die, and he was ready to bless his children, and the oldest, which was Esau, barely, but the oldest was the one who received the, the most blessing. That's just the way that it, it was in the tradition. <coughs> excuse me, that the oldest would receive the most blessing. Well, Jacob teamed up with his mama, and they decided to disguise him as Esau because Isaac was blind and couldn't see anything anyway. And he, dis he uh, dressed him up, put the, the pelt on his arm so that he felt hairy and, and made him smell like Esau and all this kind of thing. And he ended up taking the, gr the blessing that belonged to Esau, and he took it away from him which is the whole reason why he fled his home in the first place because Esau was going to kill him. He had already taken his birthright and now he had taken the blessing that belonged to him and he received a lower blessing, a lesser blessing than what he should have because of the swindling of Jacob. That's who Jacob was. Now, we use Jacob as a perfect example of you reap what you sow. Because if you recall the story of Jacob, he goes and he sees uh, a beautiful woman. He sees Rachel and he decides he wants to marry her. And, and he's going to work for seven years so that he can have her as his bride. And then after seven years, turns out, oh, wrong girl. We got you, Leah, instead. So if you work for me for another seven years, then I'll give you the one that you were actually wanting. And so you know, we see where it kind of came back at him. And a lot of things happened with Jacob as far as uh, he matured in that time let me tell you that any time that you end up going through tribulation and trial you're going to have a time of maturity amen you're going to end up growing up you're going to end up getting to a place where you're going to look at things a little bit differently than you looked at before I believe that's one of the reasons that the Lord allows us to go through what we go through but uh, let me come back to uh, what I was saying that I could preach that just all day by itself so Jacob is at a place now where he was, he was going out, and word gets back to him that Esau and all his buddies are coming Jacob's way. And Jacob is scared to death. He knows that Esau is ready to kill him. He just knows, because the last time that he saw his brother, that's what his brother said he was going to do. He knows that Esau wants to take his life. So what he does is he begins to, he, Jacob had become a, a very wealthy man. He began to send out uh, gifts of donkeys and of rams and of lambs and, and of camels and all these things going before him. He, he decided, I'm going to put all this stuff out there first and then I'm going to make my way. So hopefully he'll be happy before he actually gets to me. So in this passage that we're reading, he comes to the tributary of, of Jabbok, and it means a place of passing over. And he comes to this place, and he sends his, his wife and his children, he sends them ahead, and then he stays at Jabbok by himself. And as he is at this place, we need to understand 
that there are some times when we're coming to a transition in our lives, we've got to know that we've got to go through it by ourselves. There's, there are sometimes some things that I'm sorry, but your pastor can't hold your hand through it. Your wife or your husband can't hold your hand through that. You can't turn to mama and say, mama, would you just help me with this? Would you carry me across? Would you help me get on my way? There are some times we've got to understand it is me and God. I am face to face with God. I've got no excuses. I'm at my most vulnerable. I can't be pointing to somebody else the way that Adam did to Eve and said, well, she started it or anything like that. I've got to be face to face with God. And some of us, what it is, is that we have gotten to Javik, 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 Javok, whatever you want to call it. We've gotten to the river, but we haven't crossed over and we haven't sent our family over and our friends over. We haven't sent those things over yet because we're afraid to face God on our own. Because we know that what we have done in our lives up till now is not everything that God has asked us to do. Understand that Jacob was at a place where he was a changed man. There's no question about it. We can even take a look. If you, uh, if you realize back in... Uh, let me get to the right verse, excuse me. If you go back to the place in uh, Genesis chapter 28, verses 20 through 22, this is after Jacob had seen the, uh, the ladder, uh, Jacob's ladder, and, and God had blessed him, and God had said all these great things about what he was going to do for him, and, and all these, uh, these uh, wonderful blessings that he was going to give him. He said, I'm going to bless your seed, and I'm going to give you the land on, uh, where you lie, and all that sort of thing. And then we take a look at Jacob. I want you to listen to the attitude listen to the mindset of Jacob's words in this in in Genesis chapter 28 verses 20 through 22 Jacob and Jacob bowed a vow saying if God will be with me if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Now, unless you're looking for it, you may have missed Jacob's attitude in this, this little speech that he says here. You may have missed what had just happened. He had seen this ladder, the angels coming up and down, and I've preached about Jacob's ladder before and how it represents our access to the throne. He had, he had just seen this, and God had come to him and said, this is what I'm going to do for you. I, the land you're on, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless your kids. I'm going to bless your family. I'm going to bless your seed. Everything that you touch is going to be blessed. I'm going to do this for you. How would you like to have God speak to you personally? And say, I'm going to give you the land that you're on. And I'm going to bless you. And everything you touch is going to be blessed. Your children are going to be blessed. Your grandchildren are going to be blessed. For generations, you're going to walk in blessing. How would you like to have God speak that to you directly into your life? But Jacob's answer was not one of humility. Jacob's answer was one that I think that we would get from some people today. It was entitled. It was an answer of entitlement. It was an answer of, well, tell you what, God, let's make a deal. If, if you'll be with me, and if you will keep me in this way and give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so I can come back to my father's house in peace, then will I worship you. That's the attitude Jacob had. And unfortunately, that attitude is seen in the church today. Because we have people that will say, well, God, this is what I'm praying, and, and this is what I want you to do, and I, I want you to move in this way, and I want you to do these things. And if God says no, then all of a sudden, well, God isn't real, or I'm not serving God, or I'm mad at God, or why should I serve God? Because we were making these demands, and God said, but no, this isn't the time for that right now. You aren't supposed to be there right now. You're supposed to be doing something else. I, I know you want this, but it's not best for you to have this because I have something greater in store. Well, then I'm just going to take my Bible and go home. 
You know, the preacher is preaching things that make me feel bad about myself because he's talking exactly about what I'm going through, and that makes me mad, so I'm going to find myself another church to go to. Or, you know what, I'm mad because I prayed that God would give me the lottery numbers, and he didn't do it, and I didn't win, so I'm just going to stay home, and I'm going to just do my own thing. We make these conditions with God. God, we will love you as long as you keep doing all these things that I want you to do. It's easy to give God praise when all the bills are paid, when nobody is going to the doctor, when we have everything that we need, all the vehicles are working right, the job is going great, we just got our raise, the sun is shining and everything is perfect. It's easy to live for God in that situation. It's easy to give God praise in that situation. But here's the thing that we've got to remember is that even if all those things turn opposite on us, even if we lose our job, even if we have struggles in our marriage, even if we have have struggles in our body, even if our bank account seems to get drained, even if it seems like nobody wants to have anything to do with us, God is still worthy of praise. He's still worthy of worship. He's still worthy of you to live for him just because he's God. God's glory and God's majesty is not dependent upon whether you have given him a five-star review or not. God is still worthy of praise. He's still worthy for us to glorify him and to magnify him if everything in your life is going absolutely wrong he's still God if you feel like that the world has just just discarded you and thrown you on the heap of the landfill he is still God if you've got more sickness in your body than the doctors even know how to pick out God is still God. He, he isn't worthy of your praise because things are going well for you. He's worthy of your praise because he is God. It's the immature, uneducated Christian that says, well, God, I'll live for you if. God, I'll live for you as long as you. Lord, you keep up your part of the bargain and then I'll keep up mine. That's the way that Jacob was. And then he went through a time of maturing. He went through a time of change and of transformation. He went through a time where he found out what it was like to actually work for something that he wanted. He went through a time where he found out what it felt like to have somebody betray his confidence. He went through a time where he knew what it was like to be cut off from everything that he had known because of his own actions. But he wouldn't take responsibility for it. You know, he, like I said, that, that phrase right there that uh, Jacob was making when he was saying that if God will do this, if he'll put clothes on my back and bread in my mouth and if he'll let me get to my father's house in peace without having any problems and, you know, then I'll go ahead and I'll serve him and, and if you give me a bunch of stuff, I'll make sure and give you 10% of it back. You know, that was entitlement. That was a God, you owe me this. That was a God, you made a covenant with my father, you made a covenant with my grandfather and it's about time you made one with me. And if you'll do all this, then yeah, okay, I'll go ahead and I'll serve you. And instead, he should have been saying, God, I'm not worthy of any of this. God, I'm not worthy of anything that you, uh, you're you uh, offering to me. I'm not worthy of one thing that you have put before me that you said that you're going to give to me. I'm not worthy of it, God. If you give it to me, then so be it, and I will bless your name. But even if I never receive it, God, I'm still going to bless your name. Church, can we get that kind of an attitude? Can we get to that place in our life where we say, God, I know your word says that I've never seen the righteous forsake nor is seed begging bread. I know your word says that if we give, it shall be given unto us, pressed down, shaken together, running over, it will be flowing into our bosom. I know, God, that your word says that you shall supply all of my need according to your riches and glory. But, God, even if you don't, even if I'm wanting you to take care of this and for some reason it doesn't get taken care of, I'm still going to worship you. I'm still going to live for you because you are my Savior and my Lord. Because the one thing that you have given me that goes beyond anything I could get on this earth 
is that you gave me your blood from Calvary so that my sins could be redeemed, so that my soul could be bought, bought with that price, so I could be reunited with the God who created me. I don't deserve anything else. I don't need anything else, God. As long as you are my Savior, I will serve you. You have spilled your blood for my sin. You have bore the stripes upon your back for my healing, God. And as long as you have received me and have redeemed me and I have received you as my Savior, that's the only reason I need to live for you. That's the only reason I need to get up and to get into church and to worship you with other uh, like-minded believers. That's the only thing I need so, to make sure that I'm giving according to Scripture, according that I'm tithing as I'm supposed to and giving in the offerings as I'm supposed to. That's the only reason that I need so that I will sacrifice of my time and I'll give it to ministry or I'll give it to missions or I'll give it to somehow to win souls to the kingdom of God. I don't need you to bribe me with anything. I don't need you to even offer me anything, God, because you've already given me the most important thing I could possibly ask for, and that is salvation from sin. That is that you reached down and took me out of the pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon the rock, and you established my going. We don't need to worship God because of what God does for us day to day. We need to be worshiping God because He is God. Somebody give Him praise in this house today. <laughs> Glory to God. So Jacob comes to Javik and he wrestles. And let me tell you, it's a struggle sometimes. I believe there are people in the church that they love God with all their heart. They are dedicated to God. They serve Him. But there's just something they haven't been able to get rid of. And so they've been limited in what they're able to do. There's maybe a secret sin. Or there's a, a secret, uh, some kind of a bondage that maybe nobody knows about. Maybe somebody else does know about it. It seems like no matter how hard you try, you just can't get rid of it. You just can't let it go. It's just still there. You, you love God. You want to follow His commandments. You want to live for Him all the days of your life, but there's this one thing. And what that one thing does, what we're doing as far as what Jacob was doing, you know, Jacob was faced with this trouble with Esau coming. And instead of saying, God, I, I put myself in your hands and I believe in your mercy and your grace and I just know that you're going to keep me. And if, if Esau comes and takes my life and he sends me to be with my fathers, then so be it. But I'm going to rely on you as my protection, as my covering. I'm going to rely on you as my God. He didn't do that. He sent out all these gifts to try to appease the problem. He even says in Scripture that I will send these out to appease him. The reason why we've got people in the church that are still struggling with secret sin, that are still struggling with bondages that they can't get rid of, that no matter how often they say they want to get rid of it, and maybe they truly, deep down inside, they truly do want to get rid of it, the reason why they're still struggling with it is because instead of giving it to God, we're trying to appease it. And we're saying, okay, every now and again... I'm going to yield to this. Every now and again, I'm going to let this be in my life. And then I'll just suffer and be, feel guilty. And then I'll get away from it. And, but then that will give me a break for a little bit. We try to appease it. We try to say, well, okay, I'm not going to get rid of this. So instead of what I'm going to do, even though this is still in my life, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to go ahead and really amp up what I'm doing over here. You know, it's like I've got this sin in my life and I feel bad about this. And I know that it's not pleasing to God. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start uh, helping the church more often uh, with with, with different uh, activities or I'm going to start giving to uh, uh, to different charities and missions or, or I'm going to start doing all these kinds of things so that I can I can be focused on that this is still here this is this hasn't gone anywhere the secret sin that secret bondage is still here but I'm going to put my focus over here so I don't remember this so I don't think about this so I don't feel guilty about this that's going to make me feel better but my friend until you get over there and you deal with it until you get over there and you do something about it it doesn't matter what you do on this side it doesn't matter how much you give. It doesn't matter what kind of time you give. It doesn't matter how much you read the word. It doesn't matter how many churches that you, uh, that you give money to or anything. This is still the problem that needs to be dealt with and it needs to be dealt with before it kills you. If you have a broken leg 
and you're in pain and that leg needs to be set, and maybe you need to have surgery to fix that leg, it's not going to do you any good to go get dental implants so that your teeth are shiny white. It's not going to do you any good to go get hair plugs, hallelujah, to try to, you know, but my leg is broken, but my smile is good and my hair is fabulous. But your leg is still broken. There's still a problem that has to be dealt with. Jacob had a problem and it needed to be dealt with. And the way he felt he needed to deal with it was to appease it. I'll send him all these gifts and then by the time he gets to me, maybe he'll be softened enough to where it's not going to be an issue and maybe he won't kill me. Maybe he'll just punch me in the face or something, but maybe he won't kill me because I've given him all these gifts. Instead of just turning to God and saying, I put myself in your hands and I'll allow you to be my protection and I'm just going to go to him and I'm going to beg for his forgiveness. I'm not going to try to buy him off. I'm not going to try to bribe him. I'm just going to beg for his forgiveness. So he goes and he gets to Jobbik and he's standing there and he doesn't make the transition. The Bible says that he sends his wife, his wives and their handmaidens. He sends all of his sons. He sends all these other people and everything that he had. The Bible says he sent everything that he had. Everything that he had crossed over. But he remained because it was still a work that needed to be done. And he stayed there alone by himself until he began to wrestle with God. I'm telling you, church, it's time for you to just see God face to face and to just say, Lord, let's just let's just get through this. It's going to hurt. It's going to be painful to me. I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm going to feel guilty. I'm going to feel like, or I'm going to be shown things that I've done wrong that I don't want to remember that I've done. But I know, Lord, that I've got to get through this before I can go any further with you. Before I can make that transition over Jobbik. Before I can make that transition into the next phase of my life. Into the next phase of my ministry. Into the next phase of my relationship with you. Before I can do that, Lord, there's some things we've got to wrestle about. There's some things that we've got to, we've got to deal with and it's going to be painful for me but God I know it's got to happen I know it's got to take place as God is wrestling him he, he touched him in the hollow of his thigh I think it's interesting that it was the thigh that he touched you know if I'm wrestling with somebody and if I can just touch him and put something out of socket well if he's got a hold of me I'm going to touch his arm so that his arm gets all weak and, and does all that I pulled a muscle in my shoulder. I have no idea what I did other than being old. But I pulled a muscle in my shoulder. And, and now, even just to try to raise my hand, it's like, oh, that hurts. You know, or, or I, I'm just like trying to tie my shoes and I pull the laces too tight. And oh, yeah. And it just, you know what I mean? Those kind of pains? No, I'm the only one? Okay, great. But, but I, you know, if I was wrestling with somebody and he was holding on to me, I wanted him to let go, I'd be touching his arm. But I think it's interesting that he touched his, his thigh. Because the thigh, putting the hand on the thigh in Hebrew tradition is a sign of a covenant. It's a sign of a breaking, uh, of a unbreakable covenant. It's a sign of a promise that's being done between the two individuals. When Abraham had sent his servant to go find Isaac's wife, he'd made him put his hand under his thigh and promise and make a commitment to him that he was going to do what Abraham told him to do. And so when God had reached down and touched his thigh, he wanted to make sure because he knew what was going to happen he knew that there was going to be a covenant that was already made but there was even going to be a newer covenant that was going to be made right here and now he knew that he was going to do that and he touched his thigh and touched the hollow of his thigh and it put it out of joint and for the rest of his life Jacob had to deal with that and it was a reminder of him wrestling at Jabbok it was a reminder of him getting face to face with God it was a reminder of what he had told God and what God had told him it was a reminder of that covenant. But Jacob did something, or there, there's something interesting here that we could just real easily overlook and, and move on. As he's wrestling with him. Going into verse uh, 26, I believe it is, of chapter 32. He says, 
And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. Verse 27 seems like it's just sort of thrown in there. It was just part of the conversation that they kept. Why would God ask him what his name was? He already knew who he was. Why would God say, what's your name? What did I tell you at the beginning of the sermon that Jacob meant? It meant he was a con man. He was a swindler. He was a liar. He was a cheat. He was a thief. Our names identify us. Our names are part of our identity. If somebody calls out the name Chris, I immediately am looking around because that's me. I have never looked around when somebody yelled out Jerome. It's not me. I know they're not talking to me unless they think my name is Jerome and then that's on them. But our name is part of our identity. The whole reason why Jacob was named what he was named was because of what happened at birth. And then he lived through that identity in his life. So when God is saying, what is your name? What is Jacob's response? His response is Jacob. And you think, well, of course, what else would he say? What was actually going on in this conversation? God was saying, who are you? I want you to admit to me who you are. I want you to be for the first time in your life. I want you to take responsibility for your actions, for your thoughts, for your deeds. You tell me who you are. Not even, it, 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 probably more appropriate instead of what is thy name should have been like, who are you? What are you? What have you become? And his response was not, well, they call me Jacob, but the thing is, is that that's not what I chose. He didn't say that. He immediately said his name was Jacob. So here's the, what really is happening in this conversation. He's been wrestling with God all night. He says, I'm not going to let you go. He's finally gotten to a place of determination. And it doesn't matter the pain that he's going through. It doesn't matter the struggle that he's going through. Because he's finally gotten to a place where he's determined that he wants more of God. That he wants more of, of the, the Savior, of the Lord that he has been serving. He is finally become determined that no matter what happens he's got to get more of God and even though he's in great pain now and his thigh is, is separated and, and he's, he's hurting and he's still holding on for dear life and then God says who are you? What are you? What have you been your whole life? What is your personality? What are the attributes that show us who you really are? And he looks up and he is holding on for dear life. He looks up, he says, I'm a liar. I'm a cheat. I'm a swindler. I'm a con man. I'm a thief. There's no more pretense. There's no more trying to cover it up. There's no more trying to focus on the good part of me. Well, I'm a church member. Or I'm a Sunday school teacher, or I'm I'm on the women's board, or or I'm on the church board, or or I'm I, I do stuff with with the conference. No more of let's focus on all the good things. Instead, let's take a look at who I really am. Jacob could have said, "Well, I'm the husband of two, and the father of many, and I've made all this money, and and you'll take a look at my bank account and see how wealthy I am, and I'm I'm." considered uh, uh, very prestigious in my community and everybody thinks so highly of me that's not where Jacob was because he had gotten desperate because he needed God to do something in his life before he could cross over Jabbok before he could go to the next place before he could make that transition and he knew that I'm holding on to God he knows exactly who I am he's asking a question he already knows the answer to I just need to admit to myself who I am God I'll tell you who I am I'm a liar I'm a thief I'm a swindler God I'm somebody who has only thought of myself I'm somebody who has put aside all ethics and morals when it comes to things uh, that are going to benefit me I don't mind stepping on somebody to get to a place to make me a little bit higher I don't mind going ahead and lying and cheating if it puts me in a better light God I don't
don't mind breaking your laws and break and, and committing sin on purpose with no question about it if it makes me feel good about myself it makes me feel good for the moment God I, I, that's who I am I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm wretched Lord I, I'm just I'm so poor in spirit God Lord I'm just a nobody I'm a nobody Father even though I've tried to make myself into somebody great God I am I'm just a sinner and it wasn't until Jacob admitted who he was that God suddenly said, your name is no longer Jacob, but you are Israel. Which means to strive with God, and it also means prince of the Most High God. Because he admitted who he was. Because he wrestled with God. Because he said, God, I've been this person for so long, but Lord, I'm ready to be somebody else. I'm ready to be somebody else. Don't you think it's interesting that Jacob was saying, I'm not letting you go until you bless me? Well, God had already said, I'm going to give you all the land that, you've lied, or that you're lying on. I'm going to bless your seed. I'm going to bless all this kind of thing. But maybe the kind of blessing he was wanting was not one of money, was not one of fortune. But instead, maybe what he was wanting to be blessed with was forgiveness and grace and mercy. When we can get to the place where we become desperate with God, where we can get to the place where we say, God, I, I know who I am. I know who I have been. I know the way that I've failed you. We don't like to admit that we have failed. We don't like to admit that we're wrong. That's just kind of human nature. You know, a husband and wife will have a fight for a week because somebody doesn't want to admit that they left the kitchen light on. You know, they, I mean, my boys will fight tooth and nail about who left the door open because neither one of them are going to admit it and I know it wasn't me and Crystal and sweetheart's too short but they will fight it wasn't me well I didn't do it well it wasn't me and I mean they, they'll pull out knives if they have to they're going to go to war over this because they don't want to admit that they're wrong we don't want to admit that we're wrong, but yet that's the only way we're going to be able to cross over and transition into the place that God wants us to be is when we admit our faults and we admit the fact that we can't do it on our own, but we can only do it the, through the strength and the mercy and the grace of God. When Jacob crossed over, if he would have crossed over with his family, he still would have been Jacob. He would have crossed over that river, but there would have been no transition in his life. He just would have been going from one place to another. But he had finally gotten to the place where he decided, I can't go any further. I can't do one more thing. I've got to get by myself with God. I've got to handle this, me and God. And I've got to admit everything that I am so that he can make me everything he wants me to be. Only through his grace and his mercy can we find forgiveness. But only through our admission that we are who we are can we find forgiveness. You're not going to be forgiven of your sins if you don't admit that you're a sinner. You're not going to get anywhere with God. You're not going to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You're not going to get to that place where you are walking in the anointing of the power of the Holy Ghost if you don't admit that there are things in your life that you have done wrong and there are things in your life that need to be taken out. Things that you've ignored. Things you've conveniently forgotten about. Things that you have appeased. Well, that's just a part of me. It's just a part of who I am. I'm not going to get on to whether smoking a cigarette is going to send you to hell or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not going to clothesline preach, as they say. But I will say this, that the times that I've talked to people who have said that they wanted to quit smoking, and maybe they would quit, but then they would start back up again. And I would talk to them and say, you know, why, why did you go buy another pack? Well, I never got rid of the one that I had. Why? Were you wanting to have that as a parachute? Wanting to have that as a safe landing place so you can go back to that? Or, well, I just, I was going through a really stressful time, so I went and I bought another pack and, 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 and you know, I just started, I just wanted one. That's all it was, but now I've kind of started up again. But why would you do that? If you knew that you had gotten it out of your life, why would you go back to that? Or did you ever really get it out of your life? 
And I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm just, I'm, I'm just talking to them as I say this. And I'm, I'm, because the thing is, I don't want them to be bound by anything, especially something that can give them cancer and all this kind of stuff. I don't want them to be bound by anything. But the thing is, is that we'll, we'll find excuses to do whatever, you know, any kind of excuse we can so that we can keep doing what we're doing. We will work harder to find excuses to justify our sin than we will put, putting in the effort to pray so that God would forgive us and remove the sin from us in the first place. And somehow we find that easier. But my friend, when Jacob got to Javik, musicians come if you would please. When Jacob got to Javik, I can imagine him seeing that river, seeing that tributary. Knowing he has to cross over. And maybe the Holy Ghost began to deal in his heart. And he said, ladies, get the kids. Y'all go over. Servants, come on. Get all my stuff. Everything. Y'all go on over. Well, Daddy, aren't you coming with us? I'll be there. But not yet. I've got some stuff to do. Y'all just go ahead and take everything. Take, I, I don't even want a pillow. I don't, I don't want anything. I, I don't want a blanket. I don't want a pillow. I, don't want, I want nothing that I have earned or that I have worked for. I don't want anything of my life that, that I'm, I'm, it's going to make me feel entitled. I don't want any of it. I just want you to take it all and cross over. I'll be there when I'm done doing what I've got to do. He got a determination in this world that was going to keep him as Jacob that was going to keep him as the liar and the cheat that he was now it was time for him to give himself over to God and what happened God showed mercy God showed grace and God put an even greater blessing upon him you were a thief but now I've given you a new identity you're not that person anymore. You're not Jacob, the thief anymore. You're not Jacob, the liar anymore. Because I've given you a new identity. Now you're a prince. Now you're a prince of God. Stand with me this morning. I just want to ask you, is there something in your life that you've been, you've been struggling with and the thing is nobody knows this but you? You know, the preacher may get up and may say some things and it might hit some, some familiar chords, but even as well as I know some of you, I don't know everything that's going on in your life. I don't know everything that's going on in your heart and in your mind. I don't know everything that you're dealing with, but you do. I don't know about every lie you've told, but you do. I don't know about every time that you've stepped on somebody else just so you could advance yourself, but you do. I don't know about every time that you have gone to the altar and cried tears and begged God's forgiveness and gone home and been the exact same person that you were before you went to the altar, but you do. As you close your eyes in this house today, I want you to picture yourself standing before the river. This, this river that I've got on this, uh, this tributary I've got up here, that's actually Jabbok. That's, uh, I found that picture online, and that's the actual tributary we're talking about. I want you to picture yourself standing on the bank. You're alone. You don't have any friends or family that you can hold on to or that can help you through this you're alone and you know you're about to see God now I know that right now saying that we say oh I would absolutely admit everything because he already knows I would absolutely admit that I'm, I'm this and I'm that. I would absolutely admit that I've got these addictions or I've got these bondages. I would, no question in my mind, that I would admit, admit that I've got this kind of a sin because He already knows and I'm face to face with Him. Well, when we come to the altar, He already knows. Even if you don't come to the altar, He already knows. When you go home today, He knows. When you're eating dinner this evening, 
he knows. When you put your head on the pillow tonight, he knows. When you get up tomorrow and you just go live your Monday life, he knows. So what's the point of putting on the charade? What's the point? Well, but if I can fool those that I'm around, if I, if I can convince those that are around me that, that I'm, I'm right with God, if I can convince those that are around me that I'm okay with God, who cares if I think you're okay with God? The only one that matters is God himself. I'm going to pray, and if you'd like to come to this altar and pray, you are welcome to do it. I want you to, I want you to get to your place of Javik. I want you to say, God, I'm putting everything else aside, putting everything else on the other side. But before I can go to that next step in my life with you, we've got some wrestling to do. Before I get to that other side with you, I've got some confessions that I need to make. And if you say that, I'm going to leave these altars open as I begin to pray. And I want you to begin to come up here. And I want you to begin to pray. And I want you to begin to seek God. And I don't want you to worry about, well, is somebody going to pr come pray with me or not? Are they going to come put oil on my head or not? Because Jacob was by himself at the bank of Javik. You've got to get alone with God. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you because of your word and because of the way that you call us, Father. Lord, I thank you that no matter what we have done, God, you are there and ready to disperse mercy and grace to any that would accept it. But Lord, I think there's some wrestling that might need to be done. Maybe it's in the spirit. Maybe, maybe it's, it's with ourselves, God. I don't know. But I believe that there's wrestling that needs to be done. I believe that maybe there are some things that are in our lives, God, that are holding us back from being everything that you desire for us to be. And until we get rid of that, Lord, we're never going to cross over into that next place in our lives. Lord, in the name of Jesus. Would you just take away our, our pride? Would you take away our boastfulness? Would you take away our concern about reputation? And God, instead, would you just wrestle with us today? Lord, would you wrestle with us today and break us down, God, so that when you ask us who we are, we'll admit who we are, Father, not because we're proud, but so that you can make us somebody different, so that you can change us. The Word of God says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. That doesn't just apply to initial salvation, but that applies to everything every day of our lives as we are going through our lives and as we are holding on to the things of the world, God, it applies to that as well. Lord, would you just wrestle with us, wrestle with our hearts, wrestle with our spirits till we are so miserable that we have no choice but to turn to you and turn everything over to you because it's at that place, God, it's at that place that you're going to change us into a new creature. It's at that place you're going to give us a new identity. It's at that place, Father, that we're going to have the freedom in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We glorify you and thank you, Lord. We thank you for Javik. We thank you for that place of transition, God. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's sing this song together as we get ready to dismiss today. Oh, Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior Jesus like the fragrance after the rain Jesus Jesus oh Jesus let all heaven and earth proclaim kings and kingdoms will all pass away 
But there's something about that name. Lord, we praise you for allowing us to be in your house today. God, I thank you for each one of these that have come out and those that are watching online. Lord, I pray blessings and favor upon their lives as they give themselves over to you. Lord, I pray that you will dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence, God. And let us walk in your favor and your glory and your blessing each day of our life. In the mighty and wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you for being here. Don't forget to be here for service on Wednesday. We're going to be talking about end times again. Looking forward to having you here. God bless you.